Good morning, good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, Pres Professor Oliveira, Carlo, Professor Dr. Agnes Mira, Agnes, members of the NES and honored guests. Thank you for the invitation and honor to share with you our ongoing clinical and research experiences with functional brain imaging, electrophysiology, and tinnitus, the QEG Loretta, electroencephalotinnitography, on the occasion of the 45th meeting of the NES in Sao Paulo, Brazil. Barbara Goldstein and I, <clears throat> our team, congratulate Dr. Agnes Smira on assuming the position as president of the NES. Mazel tov. We join with friends and colleagues in Budapest, Hungary on the transfer of the NES to its new home in Budapest. We look forward under the leadership of Agnes to join with all to continue the tradition of the NES as taught and practiced by our friend and colleague Klaus. Open discussion and the advancement of neurotology for the ultimate benefit of the patient. It is with fond remembrance that I reflect on my past invitations and visits to the Department of Otolaryngology, Professor Carla Oliveira in 2004, and in 2007 to Porto Alegre for the meeting of the Brazilian Otolaryngology Society, Professor Louis Levinsky, President. The invitations reflected an initial interest for tinnitus in Brazil and South America. What was an interest for a few colleagues has grown over the intervening years and has been marked by outstanding original contributions for tinnitus theory, diagnosis and treatment for the ultimate benefit of the tinnitus patient. A confidence in the continued original contributions for tinnitus of all clinical types in Brazil and South America has been demonstrated by the NES transfer of the International Tinnitus Journal in 2010 to Brazil. The official journal of the NES, Professor Carla Oliveira, President and his staff. Today, I shall present our ongoing experiences with the present EEG technology in its projection into the future. The title of our talk is Functional Brain Imaging, Electrophysiology and Tinnitus, the QEG Loretta, which we have named the Electroencephalotinnitography, the ETG, to update where we are at the present and to project it to the future. We have now had the Declaration of Helsinki, the IRB of the Martha Antimon Tinnitus Research Center, in compliance with ethical and moral criteria and recommendations for human research and investigation, we have no disclosures. We acknowledge Professor Extraordinarius in Neurotology, Klaus Clausen of the University of Würzburg and the NES for introduction to the QEG in 1999, Elmo Weiler and Klaus Brill for instruction in the QEG in 2000, to Dr. Guillermo Oscar Bertora and Dr. Julia Bergman de Bertora in Buenos Aires, Argentina, for their initial presentation of the QEG at the NES meeting in 2001, and to the Martha Entomantinus Research Center Incorporated for ongoing support of this educational and research effort. This presentation here now will speak of functional brain imaging, electrophysiology, as it is now in 2015. There'll be a brief history of experiences that you and the audience have also experienced but we're focusing on what we have done. Since 1999, there have been significant advances, 1989. Firstly, a principle of sensory physiology identifying components of a sensation, which are translated for neuroautologic complaints of nerve loss or hearing, vertigo, and tinnitus. And the QEG Loretta, to present its background, the theory, the basic essentials of EEG for neurotology, and the recent addition of source localization. To also mention biophysiological processes that now can be identified of the thalamocortical oscillation and dysrhythmia. Clinical application, the QEG Loretta for research, diagnosis, and treatment, and source of localization which allows correlation with nuclear medicine and brain imaging. And to illustrate this with a case presentation of a cochlear implant sore failure and where the QEG allows an objective measure to monitor tinnitus treatment efficacy and for clinical research. A preliminary report of the QEG Loretta, where we've taken central type tinnitus cases and tried to identify the tinnitus signal and to show what the similarities and differences are with tinnitus and pain. Why should you and the audience consider including QEG Loretta into the tinnitus evaluation in 2015? As you pay attention to what we're now gonna present, 
I would hope that this supports why you should come to a positive answer to this. And for the future, we consider that electroencephalotinetography, the ETG, which we have called, is analogous to the EKG in the 1930s. And the conclusions to provide take home messages and to remember that whenever we speak of tinnitus in this presentation, we're speaking of a predominantly central type subjective idiopathic tinnitus of the severe disabling type. What are our objectives? To present the clinical goals of different types of functional brain imaging and their translation for tinnitus diagnosis and treatment. Secondly, to present method and clinical application of low frequency resolution electromagnetic tomography analysis, the Loretta, for recording electrical activity in brain. Present the basics of EEG for functional imaging for tinnitus diagnosis and therapy, the QEG Loretta, and to present QEG monitor function for treatment efficacy for tinnitus control in a cochlear implant sore failure case, implant failure being that of tinnitus production. Next, to present preliminary QEG Loretta data in a central type tinnitus to show pain and tinnitus matrices, similarities and differences all in a goal to identify a tinnitus signal. And to have a take home message, the recommendation to include the EEG functional imaging, the QEG Loretta, for a particular type of tinnitus, a predominantly central type subjective idiopathic tinnitus of the severe disabling type, as an adjunct to the clinical diagnosis for tinnitus and to monitor the function for identification of treatment efficacy and to serve as a method for treatment, an EEG-based neurofeedback system. The short history here now was always from the start to have the goals of trying to objectivize a subject of auditory complaint, be it aberrant, and treatment for all clinical types and subtypes of tinnitus, and thirdly, to identify the medical significance of the tinnitus. We started with the ABR short responses way back in the late 70s, in the early 70s. And in 1991, we published a paper on here observations of simultaneous auditory brainstem responses with monooral stimulation in the tinnitus patient. We started with the medical audiologic tinnitus patient protocol, the MATPP, to try to identify different clinical types of tinnitus and translate that for treatment. We got involved with electrical stimulation of tinnitus control in 1985 for the first time showing how external electrical stimulation can result in tinnitus control. We're pleased that here now, in 2011, we have the cochlear implant that is now being used in particular single cases for attempting tinnitus control. And then our good friends and colleagues here in Germany, Klein Jung, Eichenhammer, Langeth, Derrida, et al., who now are using transcranial magnetic stimulation for that having to do with <coughs> attempting tinnitus control. And we then got involved not a large amount, but only with a few cases with this system. And then from 1999, we got involved with quantitative electroencephalography. We wanted to start this way back in the early 80s, but we were discouraged and encouraged not to do it at that time. We were wrong. We missed out. But what is important is we have here now the ability, together with our colleagues in the Brain Research Lab at NYU, to now involve ourselves with low resolution electromagnetic tomography analysis, Loretta, with Dr. Roy John, who recently is deceased, Dr. Leslie Pritchett, and the innovator, Roberto Pascal. That team with whom we can say thank you for this. Our background here now with the METRC for the specifically QEG Loretta came with publication between 2002 and 2006, and then joining with the Department of Physiology at NYU in 2002 and 2005 of a tinnitus masking paradigm, magnetoencephalography, using the MEG technique. In 2006 through 2013 and 2014, we made different presentations. And I draw your attention to the AAO HNS Academy U lecture of electrophysiology, functional brain imaging, and tinnitus. What is functional brain imaging? It's three-dimensional imaging. If we now want to do the three-dimensional imaging with a focus on metabolism, you and I know it's the nuclear medicine the technique of positon emission tomography with PET and SPECT. 
functional magnetic resonance imaging, the fMRI focusing on blood oxygen level dependency, MEG, magnetic encephalography, MEG measuring the minute magnetic fields that are generated by electrical activity in the brain, and the Loretta system of EEG. What are the goals? The goals are source localization, the mean activity of single voxels superimposed onto a normal MRI template with coordinates of normal brain cortex. And secondly, the identification of neuronal connectivity, the connection, electrically speaking, with transmission between one anatomical structure and another, be it at a synaptic, neuronal, and or gross anatomic structural basis. The QEG, quantitative electroencephalography, a spectral analysis of the raw EEG data. So why should you in the audience consider electrophysiology functional brain imaging? Consider the following advances and highlights in auditory science and neuroscience translated for tinnitus diagnosis and treatment in the past 30 years. Firstly, the principle. All sensations have components. We can thank Samjin for that in 1972. He spoke of the sensory, that is the sensation itself, or the aberrant sensation that we're talking of, the affect behavioral component, and the psychomotor, how we use our hands, body movement, facial movement, in order to express the particular behavioral issue that now we're using in response to the sensation. And we have added what we think is very important, that every sensation, aberrant or not, has the establishment of a memory. And that next, it can be either acute or the problem here now of the sensation can be sensed over time, a chronicity. There is here in translation in 1982 for ourselves here at the Downstate Center. We translated principles of sensory physiology for tinnitus for an aberrant auditory stimulus, both for theory, diagnosis, and treatment. What are the principles of tinnitology? We listed that in 2010 in a publication. But very important is, now that we have the identification of a neural substrate, we no longer should be speaking of tinnitus as a phantom phenomena. A phantom phenomena is marked by lack of identification of neural substrates. Multiple neural substrates, electrodiagnostic, physiologic, biochemical, have been identified in tinnitus patients in brain and ear. Significant for identification is to differentiate between clinical types of tinnitus. Additional advances have shown themselves here now for definition using functional brain imaging. The old definition is a perception of sound unrelated to an external auditory stimulus. We focused at that time on ear and also maybe brain. But new is to consider tinnitus to be an aberrant auditory sensation, a conscious abnormal auditory percept reflecting a dyssynchrony and development of neural transmission within the peripheral and central cochlear vestibular system. The focus is not here on ear, but ear and brain, particularly the central brain functions of perception, consciousness, concentration, cognition, memory, attention, learning, affect, behavior, psychomotor activity, to name but a few. So sensory physiology has components of all sensations, as Sam Jing mentioned, and that is what we should try to introduce in the taking of the clinical history as well as in what we then t try to target for treatment. Biophysiological mechanism has been identified, which is critical. And now we can thank Linus in 1999, who identified thalamocortical oscillation and dysrhythmia, which alters a desynchronous sensory signal at thalamus into one of synchrony at the cortex. So what is this thalamocortical oscillation? A term to describe the synchronous firing and interaction that occurs between thalamic and cortical neurons at specific brain frequencies. The delta from 0.5 to 4, the theta from 3.5 to 7.5, the alpha from 8 to 12, the beta from 12 to 24, and the beta 2 or the gamma from 25 to 39 in the thalamocortical system. What is thalamocortical dysrhythmia? A pathophysiologic model of brainwave activity, of brain function proposed for neurogenic pain, tinnitus, abnormal movements, epilepsy, and neuropsychiatric disorders. A lesion results in deafferentation of excitatory inputs on thalamic relay cells, which initiates tinnitus. 
It's hypothesized for tinnitus that the spontaneous and constant gamma or beta-2 band of hyperactivity causes tinnitus. And Linnaeus has stated, in a deafferented state, the thalamocortical columns fire in a burst mode of 4 to 7 hertz, which results in a decrease of lateral inhibition in adjacent areas and a halo activity in the gamma band greater than 30 hertz, called the edge effect. In support of the clinical opinion that tinnitus is a symptom of ear and brain and a vital component of any and all clinical types of tinnitus, consider the following. Here you have a diagrammatic demonstration of the significant contributions of the ascending and descending central auditory system for the synthesis of the auditory signal, both normal and aberrant. Level C, rostral brainstem, trapezoid body. Level B, caudal pons, superior olivary complex, olivocochlear bundle. Level A, the rostral pons, the pontum mesencephalic regions of brain, and midbrain, medial geniculate body of the thalamus, all of which results in activation at the cortex of multiple brain functions in multiple neuroanatomic substrates, that is, a reciprocating cochleocortico-cochleo circuit. Basic information should be applied for all of us who are interested in this technique, of which all of you should be included. And they include, firstly, where do we place the electrodes for determination of potentials on scalp elected placement? We use the International 1020 System of Placement and letter number designations. The odd numbers are here on the left, the even numbers are on the right. The areas that the electrodes are placed are on the frontal area, the central areas, the temporal areas, and the occipital areas. Age metabolism. Age, metabolism, brainwave frequencies hang together. There's a brain frequency map distribution for age and power. An increase in age results in lower power for all frequencies. Hypo metabolism is reflected in lower frequencies, that is the delta and theta. Nuclear medicine spectrum, PET, particularly in the medial temporal lobe system, <coughs> practically always came up to be showing hypo metabolism. It's of interest now that we know why, because that correlates with brain activity in the lower frequencies, namely delta and theta. There's a ground state of brain activity referring to baseline distribution of brainwave activities at rest. This was referred to originally as ground state brain activity early in the 1970s and 1980s. Now it's referred to as a default brain network. Normative equations exist for EEG across the human lifespan. Here you see age increasing, power increasing, frequency increasing. And this is the map. And you notice that it is very well pronounced in the younger age. But as we get older, there is here now reduction in power and also then a reduction in visibility of the higher frequencies. The ground state of the brain is regulated by an anatomically extensive, genetically based, neurophysiologic, homeostatic regulating system. Disturbances in this system result in abnormal ties. Replications and validations demonstrate that the normals well describe normal evolution of brain regardless of ethnic background or race. Quantitative EEG should be thought of EEG in the QEG space. We can define QEG as a spectral analysis of the raw electrophysiologic data of the EEG measured, that is quantified, for the frequencies of response in brain and displayed in multimetric topographic maps, that is power, asymmetry, relative power, coherence, and phase. The frequencies of response are reflective of multiple brain functions in response to the input presence of an external internal sensory stimulus. The sensitivity of the QEG is more sensitive, that is, for example, in milliseconds, than is PET or SPECT, which are in minutes or hours, when we speak in the temporal domain. It is not specific. It is, however, highly sensitive. Correlation of the data with the clinical history and physical examination is required to establish the clinical significance of what we're seeing. This QEG provides an objective measure for display in brain of the efficacy of treatment of different modalities attempting tinnitus relief. It serves as a monitor to determine treatment efficacy. What about here now, this issue of sensitivity and specificity of the QEG? 
The QEG is a technical report of brainwave activity. Abnormalities can be detected in the measurements. It is not a mass screening test. The clinical significance for a particular diagnostic category requires correlation of the measurements with a discriminant function analysis. It is sensitive, but not specific for any diagnostic category. Data provides an adjunct function for establishment of an accuracy for the tinnitus diagnosis, medical significance, and selection for treatment. What are the metrics here now? The metrics are here definitions of power spectrum. In EEG, the power density spectrum or power spectrum is a common method for EEG quantification for the frequencies of response in brain and their density in different regions of interest in brain. The word power does not have the meaning of distributed power in an electrical circuit. The power spectrum density is a function of frequency. The dimension of the power spectrum in EEG is intensity per bandwidth. The signal dimension is in volts. Relative power is the metric relative power a measure of the relative distribution of electrical activity over the delta, theta, alpha, beta, and gamma frequencies. Asymmetry, a statistically significant degree of activity between the inter or within the intracerebral hemispheres, global or localized for a given frequency of brain activity. Coherence, very important. A frequency contingent cross-correlation measure, indexing the amount of shared activity between two scalp regions. Functionally, coherence reflects the connectivity between regions. One goes further and speaks of a connectome, a map of neural connections in brain and the evolving co co connectomics, that is a production and study of connectomes. Phase, a measure of the lead or lag of shared rhythms between two regions. Phase is a connected system, such as the cerebral cortex is a function of the EEG frequency, the difference between sites and conductive velocities. The phase relationship between channels may also be interpreted as reflecting the degree of functional differentiation between neural systems. The EEG database that one uses is critical. It's essential to identify the deviation of the EEG data from the normal and to determine the statistical significance and confidence level of the data. The QEG spectral analysis have the frequencies that I mentioned previously. In very ordinary, one can then say, the delta is from 1 to 4, theta from 4 to 8, alpha from 8 to 12, beta from 12 to uh, 40, and the gamma from 35, or the beta 2 from 35 to 40. The method we used for the QEG technique was using the Lexical Medical Technology Neurosearch 24 system. 20 minutes of EEG were collected from 19 standard locations of the International 1020 placement system. The eyes closed in the resting state. The differential eye channel was used to detect eye movement. The electrode impedance for all was below 5,000 ohms. EEG amplifiers produced a band pass of 0.5 to 70 hertz. Three decibel points with a 60 hertz notch filter. The data sampled at a rate of 20 hertz with a 12-bit resolution. We used a Thatcher normative EEG database or the neurodegenerative database from 1998. The EEG data acquisition and neurometric analysis is what we are now using since 2002 and 2005. 20 minutes of closed eye resting EEG was collected from the electrodes pasted on the scalp in standardized locations as I've just mentioned. The fast Fourier transformation and feature extraction included measures of power, inter and interhemispheric relationships between regions, and that is connectivity, and the delta, beta, alpha, beta and gamma frequency for all measures. Special was source localization, which was used to identify the mathematically most probable underlying sources of the scalp recorded data using very narrow frequency spectra. The neurometric method of QEG quantification, the first step was all extracted features were transformed to the Gaussian. Most are simple log transforms. The second step, was a Z transform relative to age expected normal values, which expressed the probability that subjects' value lies within the normal range of their exact age. Thirdly, we use the neurometric QEG norms. A normative data exists for ages 60 to 90, 
from age six to 90 years have been published and demonstrated to be culture fair and have the high test retest reliability. The potential effect of age on changes observed in the EEG is removed by describing the individual's EEG features in terms of deviations from age expected normal values using Z-scores. Again, for those in the audience who are not familiar, the Z-scores are observed scores transformed into a score with a common reference, that is a probability value. The Z-mean is zero. The stand deviation is plus or minus one. For the QEG raw power transformed into a Z-score against a normative database from the Brain Research Lab at NYU, corrected for age and other factors. A QEG power score with a value greater than plus or minus 1.96 would significantly differ at the 0.05 level from the mean of the age adjusted norm. That is, two standard deviations, a 95% confidence level. So what is this functional brain imaging that we're speaking about? Well, when we're looking at now functional brain imaging and three-dimensional imaging using nuclear medicine with PET or SPECT imaging, we're looking for metabolism changes. When we're using functional MRI, we're using blood oxygen level dependency. When we're using magnetic encephalopathy, we're measuring minute magnetic fields that are generated by electrical activity in brain. The Loretta QEG analysis has as its goals, first, source localization, the mean activity of single voxels, voxels superimposed onto a normal MRI template with coordinates of normal brain cortex. And secondly, identification of neuronal connectivity. The QEG, which we are now calling the quantitative electroencephalography spectral analysis of raw EEG data. Both the Loretta and also the variable resolution brain tomography Veretta system hypothesize that visualization methods of neuroanatomical regions that are the probable source generators in brain of changes in surface EEG activity are clinically reflective of the clinical course of the tinnitus in response to treatment. The goal, to compare favorably with the more classical functional imaging methods as nuclear medicine, PET, SPECT, and fMRI. And what is this S Loretta and E Loretta? S is the standard Loretta and E the exact Loretta. Zero error. There's a problem with EEG. That potential which we are now identifying with surface-based electrodes, what is the source generator deep within the brain? This is known as the inverse problem. And this inverse problem has now been not solved, but it advances made for knowing what takes place by now this S and E Loretta system. The Loretta, which is a low resolution brain electromagnetic tomography, has been ongoing since 1994. And S Loretta, which is the standardized Loretta, and the Z localization, and the E Loretta, which is the exact. So these systems now have now been updated, particularly since 2002. And they are an approximate solution to the inverse problem. The Veretta in 2001 was a 3D statistical parametric mapping of EEG source spectra by means of variable resolution electromagnetic tomography. Source localization is one of the highlights of the QEG Loretta system. One can speak of QEG in the Loretta space. The source localization of the scalp recorded EEG has greatly enhanced information obtained from the QEG. This method of signal processing is a solution to the inverse problem that I just mentioned, of localizing the mathematically most probable sources of voltages recording from the scalp. For ages 60 to 90, 0.5 to 50 hertz norms exist for each cubic voxels. For each voxel, an individual value are compared statistically to the expected norms for their age, just as done in neurometric analysis. Statistically significance for each voxel is encoded in color superimposed upon slices from a probabilistic MRI atlas. The anatomic accuracy of QEG source localization has been repeatedly confirmed by co-registration with other brain imaging. Here you see now the Loretta and here you see now the MRI. Here you see now the Loretta and here now you see the MRI. The clinical application of Loretta QEG is in this following case report. 
and this is of a sore failure and how it is highlight the complaint of tinnitus. This cochlear implant can also serve as a monitor function for treatment efficacy of tinnitus. The patient is now age 74, right-handed, who had the implant inserted originally in 1999. The chief complaint was one of deafness and severe tinnitus. And she then noticed on her about 2008, 2009, that she had an increase of the complaint of tinnitus and lack of function of amplification with the first cochlear implant. When you look at the QEG, you'll see a baseline of tinnitus with the cochlear implant off. And with conservative treatment highlighted by the use of gabapentin, the patient was then noticing with the complaint off about a 10 to 20% report of tinnitus improvement. With the replacement of the number one implant with the number two, following cochlear implant on, the following can then be seen. Here you see now the normative reference database comparisons for relative power. You see up above here the frequencies. Here you see the electro placements. These frequencies you notice are high, both right and left, for the, delta, for the beta frequency, here in the frontal area, as well as also in the temporal area. And that is on both sides. When now she had it originally in 2008, we asked her to now use the old implant and then shut it. And this is what she then described. Notice, as now with the second treatment that we gave, it was to stop the first implant and to just take the gabapentin. And notice the marked reduction in the beta and the increase of the delta, both right and left. More reduced on this particular right side than that of the left. And don't forget, the tinnitus was on the right side, the right side. And now, here in 2009, when the implant that was now causing the problem was removed and replaced, you notice we have here now normal values. So here we have a way of identifying a monitoring of a system of cochlear implant electrical stimulation in a patient with a complaint, a complication of a previously inserted implant. The second is the clinical application of this QEG Loretta for the thalamocortical oscillation and thalamocortical dysrhythmia. Quantitative EEG measures objective low frequency brainwave activities at multiple electro recording sites. Thalamocortical oscillation or dysrhythmia has been proposed as a model for the theory of tinnitus. PET QEG demonstration of thalamus cortical interactions supports the translation of these to a theory as a mechanism for tinnitus translation for clinical diagnosis and treatment. The demonstration of QEG treatment, efficacy monitor function I just presented. We now wanted to follow through with a clinical research project using Loretta and focusing on tinnitus. And we used the Brain Research Lab at NYU. E. Roy John has now been deceased for about two, three years. Leslie Pritchett, his wife, has assumed the directorship of the unit. Robert Eisenhardt is a scientist for brain function. The plan was to try to identify the tinnitus signal, and preliminary data was obtained. So whereas we thought we would see a tinnitus signal, instead of that with 3D brain tomography, showing QEG in the Loretta space, we didn't see a signal for tinnitus, but we did a group analysis of a predominantly central type subjective idiopathic tinnitus of the severe disabling type, and the results show the following. Similarity and differences between the tinnitus and pain matrix systems. This study included 124 tinnitus patients. The mean age was 48.29. There were 30% females and 70% males. The mean length of the symptom was two to three years. The criteria for inclusion in this study was predominantly of a central type, subject of idiopathic tinnitus of the severe disabling type tinnitus, SIT. Stage one, the QEG Loretta group analysis has been concluded and results of some of which I will describe. Stage two is now in progress and it describes and identifies objectively the heterogeneity of the tinnitus population for pathophysiological subtypes, which may be differentially, differentially applicable for treatment. Matrices for tinnitus and pain have been identified. This is an ongoing project. For tinnitus, the main regions are the primary and associative auditory cortex, the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, 
the medial temporal lobe area of the hippocampus, the parahippocampus gyrus, the orbital frontal cortex, and the mesial frontal cortex, and the anterior cingulate cortex. For pain, the main regions appear to be the insula, the anterior and posterior and middle cingulate, the parietal lobule, the dorsolateral frontal, prefrontal cortex, and the somatosensory cortex. Here you see the group average EEG source images for tinnitus population in the delta band. Color codes for significance of difference in the T-scores you notice here are in blue. And that is here significant deactivation in the delta band, including the cingulate, the anterior, middle, and posterior, and the inferior and superior parietal, and the anterior cingulate. Here you see the 3D source localization images for the tinnitus population in the 2.7 hertz delta frequency. The only significances are underactivated sources include the postcentral gyrus and the superior parietal lobule. Here you see the group average EEG source images for tinnitus in the theta band. Again, the color codes for significance are in the T-scores for regions of interest. And the maximum regions with overactivation in the theta band, overactivation, include the superior and medial temporal, the chordate, the parahippocampus, and the amygdala regions. You see here now in this theta band, involvement here very frequently of the medial temporal lobe system. Here you see the 3D source localization images for the tinnitus population. First in the 7.8 hertz, high theta, low alpha. And here in the 14.8 hertz, beta. In that of the high theta, low alpha, you see significant change in Brodmann area 41, as well as the superior temporal gyrus, the parahippocampal gyrus, and the insula. Here for the beta range, you notice significant activation in the putamen, the thalamus, the parahippocampal gyrus, and the superior temporal gyrus. Here you see the group average EEG source images for tinnitus population in the alpha band. The color codes for significance of difference in T-scores for regions of interest are here designated. The maximum regions over activation in the alpha band include the superior and medial temporal and insular regions. The group average EEG images for tinnitus population in the beta band, again the same color coding, and maximum regions of over activation are seen in the beta band include the putamen, the chordate, the thalamus, the amygdala, and the insula. By way of now orientation, here we see the thalamus and the area here then of the putamen and also the area of the amygdala. We see that here in the medial temporal lobe area. What are the differences between tinnitus and pain that we see? The most significant differences are between tinnitus patients and chronic pain patients. And there we see maximum regions of difference show tinnitus patients to have more activation in regions which include the thalamus, the amygdala, the cingulate, the medial frontal cortex, and the medial temporal lobe. The significance of differences in the EEG between tinnitus and chronic pain in the high theta low alpha are also showing increased activation in tinnitus compared to pain in the superior temporal gyrus, the medial temporal lobe, the parahippocampus, and tinnitus as I showed you before, but here you're seeing it in the surface recordings. And here in the beta, 14.8 hertz, you see most significant difference include increased activation in tinnitus compared to pain in the superior temporal gyrus, the cingulate gyrus, and the superior frontal gyrus. EEG source images for the tinnitus population can here be seen very clearly for the theta alpha in Brahman area 41, the superior temporal and the parahippocampal gyrus and the insula. And here the beta, the putamen, thalamus, parahippocampal gyrus and the superior temporal gyrus. And the difference between tinnitus and pain, most significant activation in tinnitus in the superior temporal gyrus and the thalamus. I show you this to show that different frequencies of activity have different areas of excitation in different regions of interest. Again, expressing in electrophysiological terms the multifunctionality of a given region of interest. So what is it that we're seeing? We're seeing in QEG multiple brain functions in the presence of the tinnitus signal, a pattern of brain wave frequency. The QEG is, has shown a monitor function for treatment efficacy. The Loretta of different planes, frequencies, 
of a predominantly central type tinnitus and multiple brain substrates reflect multiple brain functions, not the tinnitus signal that we thought originally. So we're seeing here tinnitus in terms of brain functions. Fourthly, the QEG group analysis of the 124 tinnitus patients were all positive, are considered to support the reliability of the medical audiologic tinnitus patient protocol to identify a predominantly central type tinnitus. The thalamocortical oscillation and thalamocortical dysrhythmia are now issues that one can now use for now understanding the clinical course of the development of the symptom of tinnitus. Pain tinnitus QEG analyses show similarities and differences. We have presented them and have implications for treatment. For example, neuromodulation, acoustic and electrical stimulation. For discussion, cochlear implant patients, patients baseline QEG is recommended for diagnosis and treatment based on brain function. The tinnitus initial and post-implantation, when it arises, is a potential soft sign of a cochlear implant failure. The SE Loretta is a method for baseline quantification and objectivization of brain electrical activity, pre and post-implantation, to rule out a cochlear implant soft failure. Medication, selection, receptor targeted therapy. Pain tinnitus QEG Loretta analysis demonstrates similarities and differences which we have presented, which have implications for treatment, neuromodulation for acoustic and electrical stimulation. And what about the future? The future is we see the emergence of an identification of a neurobiology, neurobiophysiology and neurochemistry of synaptic neurotransmission for all clinical types and subtypes of tinnitus. The future is for molecular genetics, focusing on a particular molecule which will influence a particular brainwave activity. Source localization is a big step forward. It gives us the ability for source localization to know where that potential which we're picking up at cortex, what its origin is, deep in brain. We speak of tinnitopharmacoproteogenomics, a tinnitopharmacology based on identification, individual for each patient, of their proteome and also genomic configuration. For surgery, we're interested in that of Jean Menard Daniel from Switzerland, who's spoken of a non-invasive transcranial MRI-guided high-intensity focused ultrasound system for surgery. We think the future will be of neuroplasticity and neuromodulation using acoustic and electrical systems including that for transmagnetic stimulation. So what's the take home message? Why perform QEG Loretta in 2015? This system can demonstrate advances in sensory physiology of components of a sensation. Clinical translation for their identification is reflected in multiple neuroanatomical substrates of brain function in the presence of the tinnitus signal, an aberrant auditory sensation. QG Loretta Imaging in 2015 provides a pictorial image of identification of brain functions in multiple neural substrates in the presence of the tinnitus signal, which are clinically applicable as an adjunct to establish the accuracy of the tinnitus diagnosis, selection modality of tinnitus treatment, medical significance of the tinnitus, a monitor function for a particular modality of tinnitus efficacy, and identification of the clinical course of the tinnitus and may be a potential clue for its prognosis. Thirdly, the system provides in 2015 this pictorial image of the heterogeneity of clinical types and subtypes of tinnitus manifested in a multiplicity of brain functions individual for each patient. We may not have seen now a single tinnitus signal, but what we have seen has taught us we are now needing to pay attention to this brain functions of what now it responds to input from the periphery. The QEG Loretta Brain Imaging provides in 2015 an EEG-based method for neurofeedback tinnitus control, a forerunner, we believe, of one of the future cures for a particular type of tinnitus. And lastly, QEG Loretta Brain Imaging in the future, we think will replace the pictorial image of the tinnitus matrix with a normal pictorial image of brain functions with no tinnitus and result in a cure for a particular clinical type and subtype of tinnitus, individual for each tinnitus patient. So in conclusions, 
Functional brain imaging provides an increased accuracy for the tinnitus diagnosis by objective source identification of brainwave frequency activity, a rationale for treatment, and a monitor function to identify efficacy. PET data reflects the cytoarchitecture of multiplicity of brain functions in the presence of the tinnitus signal. Frontal, temporal, parietal, thalamus, QG loretta provides an objective evaluation of low frequency brain activity in the presence of the tinnitus signal for tinnitus diagnosis and treatment and a monitor of efficacy of treatment. EEG source localization identifies clear abnormalities in a tinnitus population, supporting a central component for the tinnitus with a p-value equaling 0.05. The QEG Loretta measurement and quantification of patterns of activated brain wave frequencies clinically provide objective data of multiple brain functions in the presence of tinnitus. Similarities of patterns of activation of brain frequencies between chronic pain and tinnitus suggest translation of a hypothesis of a final common pathway for tinnitus, pain in all sensations, aberrant or normal. Seventh, the QEG demonstration of a central component for tinnitus supports the hypothesis of clinical types and subtypes of tinnitus. Number eight, the QEG Loretta identifies a pattern of the tinnitus signal by brainwave bands and frequencies and provides an electrophysiologic correlate for predominantly central type tinnitus in our judgment in 2015. Neuroanatomic substrates reflect brain function components of sensations, sensory, affect, psychomotor, aberrant tinnitus, and pain. The thalamocortical oscillation proposes a mechanism at cortex for tinnitus perception and supported by PET brain nuclear medicine imaging and QEG to improve the accuracy of the tinnitus diagnosis and also can provide a monitor function for treatment efficacy. The QEG multimetric analysis has objectively measured and quantified brainwave activity in the presence of the tinnitus signal and has been clinically translated for an accuracy of the tinnitus diagnosis. The similarities between chronic pain and tinnitus suggest a final common pathway for sensation, normal, abnormal, the significant brain function being that of memory. It is our recommendation to otolaryngology tinnitus professionals interested in tinnitus to introduce electrophysiologic functional brain imaging, QEG Loretta, for establishment of an accuracy for the tinnitus diagnosis, a rationale for treatment, and to monitor efficacy of treatment modalities with tinnitus control. The QEG Loretta identification of electrophysiologic neural substrates in a predominantly central type tinnitus supports recommendation that tinnitus is not a phantom signal. The take home message is a recommendation to otolaryngology and tinnitus professionals. Introduce electrophysiologic functional imaging, QEG and Loretta for a predominantly central type subjective idiopathic tinnitus of the severe disabling type to provide an adjunct function to establish an increased accuracy for the tinnitus diagnosis, a rationale for attempting tinnitus treatment, and a monitor function to identify the efficacy of modalities of tinnitus control or treatment. The clinical significance of the QEG Loretta for tinnitology in 2015, the electroencephalo tinnitogram, the ETG, is considered analogous to the EKG in the 1930s for cardiology. We gratefully acknowledge the assistance of Leslie Pritchett, Robert Eisenhardt of the Brain Research Lab, Pasquale de Marquis for his originality, now at the University of Zurich. We thank them for their assistance in the analysis and preparation of the EEG data. Barbara Goldstein for recording of the EEG data and to the Martha Enderman Tinnitus Research Center for support of this educational and research effort. On a personal level, I cherish the friendships, associations, and the efforts of the past and present, which we have all experienced together in the NES. In the future, these efforts will, under the leadership of the NES, be reflected professionally in the continued growth and development of the new discipline, tinnitology, for the ultimate benefit of the tinnitus patient. The multidiscipline tinnitology that was envisioned in the past in 1989 is a reality today. God willing, I look forward to the future with my dear wife Arlene and family, our team, 
good friends, Barbara, Klaus, Erica, Carlo, Marty, Mike, and Michael, and Leslie, to achieve the goal that we all share with our tinnitus patients, a cure for all clinical types and subtypes of tinnitus. Science, like life, feeds on its own decay. New facts versus old rules, the newly divined conceptions bind old and new together into a reconciling law. Thank you.